Welcome to the contracts review of consideration and its alternatives. So today we're going to go back through the whole doctrine of consideration and the alternatives of promissory estoppel and promissory restitution. Just as a reminder, what are we talking about when we talk about contracts? Contracts are promises that courts will enforce. And so a fundamental question to start at what we'll call first principles is what promises will courts enforce and why will they enforce only these types of promises? We know that every promise needs to consist of an offer that has to meet con uh, conditions we discussed, acceptance and consideration or an alternative, plus the lack of defenses like statute of frauds or a mistake. Today we're going to be talking about consideration and its alternatives, but it makes sense to go back to first principles and one of my professors, Richard Epstein, argued that we can actually reduce the entire common law to a few basic rules that explain what contract law does. What does contract law do? Well, we understand that property is a way of allocating stuff to people. Contracts is the way of putting that property to its best use, to raise property's value by mutual bargain for exchange. And then the tort rules come in to enforce those voluntary agreements, so you can't take from somebody by force or by fraud. The idea is that by having a series of mutual exchanges, when each person thinks they'll be better off, they may be right, they may be wrong, but by a series of mutual exchanges where people think they're going to be made better off by this bargain, property is exchanged from one person who values it less to one person who values it more, and the person in exchange gets something they value more than what they gave up. And so we can see that the consideration doctrine enforces exactly these type of promises. It enforces promises where people agree to trade their goods or services, because when they make an agreement to trade their goods and services, we think they're doing it for their mutual benefit. And therefore, agreements that are supported by consideration move property to its place of higher value. So then consideration should be defined by the existence of this bargain for exchange. Courts were struggling with this for a while. I think that law and economics and natural law has developed to show us that the bargain for exchange concept is the right way to think about, corporate, uh, about contract law fulfilling its purpose within the common law system of helping property move to its place of highest value. So instead of talking about it as a benefit to the promisor or a detriment to the promisee, we're going to talk about a bargain for exchange. Even if there's not a bargain, we still might enforce contracts. We might enforce them through promissory estoppel or promissory restitution. And this is the difference between law and equity. Law, as represented here by King Edward III, he actually created the first courts of chancellery. He essentially created the concept of equitable courts, but he presided over the law, whereas at that time the church, represented here by Cardinal Wolsey, presided over courts of equity. Even when a legal remedy was not possible, sometimes justice counseled for a remedy. And a person could go to a court of equity, or nowadays seek an equitable remedy, to kind of make up for when the law does not enforce a promise that it otherwise should. Let's begin with the legal remedy, consideration. Consideration is defined as the promisee's promise or performance that is induced by the promisor's promise and the result of a bargain for exchange. So here's the visual to think about that. The promise induces the promise or the performance, right? So I say, I want to buy that book from you for $10. And I'm saying that because I value the book more than I value $10. I want to give you the $10 because I want to get the book. You accept that, you make a return promise because you would rather have $10 than the book. You value something else that's worth $10 more than the book. You'd rather have the money. Our promises are thereby mutually induced. Now, of course, what I want is the performance after all. I want the book. I don't want the promise for the book. The promise is indeed a stand-in for receiving that book in the end. But we're not talking about breach right now. If you don't give me the book, you've breached the agreement. And I have remedies for that. No, the question today in formation is whether or not we have formed a promise that courts will enforce, whether we have a contract. And we need the element of consideration to do that which is defined as a bargain for exchange, or something that is bargained for in exchange. What I mean by that is the promise or performance is sought by the promisor. I'm actually looking to get the consideration that you're offering. It's inducing me to make the promise. 
I would not make the promise if I were not to receive the consideration. It doesn't have to fully induce the promise, but it has to be part. And likewise, we talk about this mutual inducement. That promisor's promise must induce the promisee's promise. The promisee's promise must induce the promisor's promise. And so we have this cycle of mutual inducement so that the consideration is for the promise and the promise is for the consideration. In this way, we have an agreement that courts will enforce because we both think we're going to be made better off by it. And common law uh, principles say that this means contract is doing its purpose of property moving to its place of higher value, and we see the societal benefit of allocating property to its place of best use. We're going to talk about the restatement of contracts for the rest of this class, but keep in mind that in your jurisdiction, wherever you're going to practice, there is specific law. So we're talking about general principles. We draw them from the restatement of law, which combines law in many different courts and talks about some general principles. And it defines consideration as a promise or return promise that is bargained for. A promise or return promise is bargained for if it is sought by the promisor in exchange for his promise. And it is given by the promisee in exchange for that promise. Again, it has to be mutually inducing. So let's take a look at a couple illustrations. Here's the simplest illustration. Here's an illustration of where we find consideration. Easy example of consideration. Not a lot of analysis required here. A offers to buy a book owned by B and pay $10 in exchange therefor. The transfer and delivery of the book constitute a performance and our consideration for A's promise. I'm looking for the book, you're looking for the $10. We've mutually induced each other. On the other hand, oh, and I should mention also that we look at, as we remember from Lucy B. Zemmer and some older cases, what are the objective manifestations? What am I saying when I ask for that book? Maybe secretly, I thought the book was worthless and I wanted to make a gift to you. That's not what we're talking about here. So long as the outward manifestations showed an intention to enter into that bargain because we'd each be made better off by it, we look at outward manifestations, not secretly held subjective beliefs. On the other hand, we have this quote unquote past consideration. Past consideration is an oxymoron. It doesn't exist. But we see here what would be quote unquote past consideration. A receives a gift from B of a book worth $10. All right. When that gift was given, the value of the book was not thought of in this transaction. When I make the gift to Mary Beth for a book worth $10, I'm not expecting to get $10 back. I'm not induced by the prospect of getting $10. Later, however, she might feel uh, that she owes me $10 and makes a promise to pay that to me. Now, this is a subsequent promise. It comes after the performance has already been rendered. It comes after I've already promised to give the book, and my giving of the book is not induced by the $10. This past consideration for something of value rendered previously is not consideration. So I put past consideration in quotes because past consideration is not consideration. However, when you have a fact pattern that looks like quote unquote past consideration, think about promissory restitution. A restitution and equitable remedy may be available even though the remedy at law is not. Likewise with a gratuitous promise. A promises to make a gift of $10 to B. In reliance, that's a key word for the concept of promissory estoppel. In reliance on the promise, B buys a book from C and promises to pay $10 for it. There's no consideration for A's promise. A made the promise because he wanted to give a gift. The gift was not induced by the receipt of $10. However, the person who was to receive the gift changed their position based on that promise. Detrimentally relied, now they owe a book that they don't have and they're contractually bound to pay it. So we look at promissory estoppel as a potential equitable remedy for a person who has made a detrimental reliance on a gratuitous promise. Sham consideration is when you pretend there's consideration when there is not. Example, A desires to make a binding promise to give $1,000 to his son, B. Being advised that a gratuitous promise is not binding, A writes out and signs a false recital. A false recital that B has sold him a car for $1,000 and a promise to pay is for that amount. There is no consideration for A's promise because it's a sham. So sham consideration is when you pretend that there's consideration because you're trying to make a promise enforceable, but it's not true. We look at whether there was actual consideration, not whether we simply wrote it down. And likewise, simply writing in consideration of on a gift pledge does not make it consideration. <clears throat> 
There has to actually be consideration, not simply words. The consideration also cannot be so small that it is nominal. Now, we'll talk in a minute that we're not going to evaluate the value of the consideration as to whether it is sufficient. But if we are offering, instead of a sham, uh, a nominal amount, in this case, a dollar for something worth a thousand, with the intention of making it binding, I don't want the dollar. I don't care about the dollar. I'm trying to make this binding. My intention is to make the deal binding by having consideration. So we write a recital that we're going to pay a dollar or a penny or a hundredth of a penny, some very small am amount. A desires to make a promise binding to give $1,000 to his son B. Being advised that a gratuitous promise is not binding, A offers to buy from B for $1,000 a book worth less than a dollar. Right, so this is, not, this is not an intention to get that book. It's an intention to make the, the uh, contract binding. B accepts the offer knowing, knowing that mere pretense is occurring. There is no consideration here. The knowledge, this is now, now that the parties actually know that the intention uh, now we look at the subjective knowledge, the actual, someone actually knows the subjective intention to enter into essentially a, uh, a false recital of consideration. They're not actually seeking uh, the, what is given in exchange. They're not looking for the inducement. As a reminder, we're not using the language of benefit and detriment. That language is used by some courts and it is used in some jurisdictions. I don't think it captures how law and economics and natural law understands the role of contracts today. So I don't use that language, and the restatement doesn't use that language. In fact, the restatement expressly explains why we don't use that language. It says, if the requirement of consideration is met, there is no additional requirement of a gain, advantage, or benefit to the promisor, or loss, or disadvantage to the promisee. This actually comes up in cases. For example, I, uh, there is this note card here. It has no value, right? Let's even say it's trash. One man's trash is another person's treasure. You really want that crumpled up note card. It's going to remind you of this class and this amazing moment you had of reviewing contract law. And so you offer me $1,000 for this crumpled up piece of paper. It has no value, but it has value to you, and you truly want it. You want to give me $1,000 to get this paper, and I want that $1,000 much more than this paper. <laughs> Under the benefit detriment theory, this would not be an enforceable contract because, in fact, I'm not incurring any detriment by giving up the paper. And in fact, you might not be getting any benefit, so to speak, because the paper has no value. But it's not the role of the courts to decide what, who has value to what. Instead, a bargain for exchange says that since you sought this paper and I sold it to you because I wanted the money, therefore, this has good and valuable consideration. And we have a binding contract under that theory. Again, an illustration, consideration without a benefit or a detriment. A has executed a document in the form of a guarantee which imposes no obligation on A and has no value. B's surrender of the document to A, if bargained for, is consideration for a promise by A to pay $10,000. So this is the illustration that shows the benefit-detriment test does not capture these type of promises. And according to the theory I'm suggesting, that we're trying to allow people to enter into free choices so property moves to its area of highest value, we enforce these type of bargains. We also don't look at whether or not the exchange is equal value. We don't look at the value of the consideration so long as it's not nominal. The exchange of unequal values is of no moment to the courts. If the requirement of consideration is met, there is no additional requirement of equivalence in the values exchanged. Ordinarily, courts do not inquire into whether consideration is adequate or not. And this is particularly true when it's difficult to measure, when something is subjective. And what that means is if you make a bad bargain, too bad, right? Too bad that you did something stupid, right? The requirement of consideration is not a safeguard against improvident contracts. And so I shouldn't have done that. Courts are not going to fix that for you. This is the nature of, of having free exchange. We're going to allow people to make mistakes. And so we don't talk about inadequate consideration, right? I'm putting quotes around this. Inadequate consideration is another thing that people talk about that doesn't really exist. There's no such thing. There's either consideration or not. Nominal consideration is not consideration because it wasn't intended to be consideration. But if it was bargain for exchange, good and valuable consideration is found. Illustration, A borrows $300 from B to enable A to begin litigation to recover a gold mine 
through the litigation. And he promises to repay $10,000 when he recovers the mine. Now, you might say $300, $10,000, that can't add up. That doesn't make sense. That's inadequate. This isn't real consideration. Well, you might be wrong. He might have really needed that money, and he's going to get a gold mine at the end. It's up to him to judge. We saw this in a case, Batsekas for uh, Demotsis, uh, right? In this case, there was a wartime situation, and plaintiff made a ridiculously uh, usurious loan. Now, we're not talking about the usury principles here, but the fact of the matter is borrowing... Uh, uh, $25 and offering to repay 2000 is, again, way out of balance. But this person wanted to escape in a wartime situation. The court enforced the agreement because it was supported by good and valuable consideration. Right? Well, that reminds us, again, Restatement 81 reminds us that the consideration simply has to be a motive or an inducing cause. The fact that what is bargained for uh, does not itself and only motivate this is okay. Let's say I want to uh, give you a gift and I also want to get some value, right? So that book that I'm offering to sell for $10 is really worth 20 Now, if I just give you the book, that's a gift. But if I give you the book and ask for $10 in return, my intention is to give you a gift of $10 and sell the book for $10. So I have mixed motives. That's okay, so long as I am at least partially motivated by the benefit of the bargain by the $10. The fact that what is bargained for does not itself induce the making of a promise, does not prevent it from being consideration for the promise, and the fact that a promise does not itself induce a performance or return promise does not prevent the performance or return promise from being consideration for the promise. And the key words here in Section 81 is of itself. It still has to be present. We still need to have consideration, but it doesn't have to explain the whole value. And this gets back to that same principle, why I'm talking about these together, of not looking at the value of the consideration. So long as a transaction is supported by some good consideration that was got in bargain for exchange, it will be enforced. A promisor must manifest an intention to induce the performance. It doesn't have to be the only reason for their intention, but there must be a manifestation that the intention is to induce the performance by the promise, and the promisee must manifest an intention to be induced by the promise. And that's why when you say, I'm going to give you a penny in return for $1,000, wink, wink, because we know we need this to be supported by consideration, right? We're actually manifesting a different intention. We're manifesting an intention that we're not being induced by the penny, that we're trying to make a binding promise. And so we get back to the concept, again, of mutual inducement and bargain for exchange. The consideration has to be the object of the promisor's desire. He has to want the consideration, and that's why entering into the deal. The desire is a material motive or cause inducing the making of the promise. I'm making the promise because I want what I'm going to get from the bargain, because I think this bargain will make me better off, even if part of that is giving a gift, even if a court may not understand the value that I'm seeking from it, even if it is a crumpled up piece of paper of seemingly no value to anyone, if it has value to you and you bargained for it, it is the object of your desire and therefore is consideration that can support that promise. And the reciprocal desire of the promisee for making the promise has to similarly induce the furnishing of the consideration. And so we see again here our chart. We have to be induced at least partly by the promise, and the promise has to be induced partly by the return promise. Even when there's not consideration, we can still enforce contracts under equitable doctrines. The equitable doctrine of promissory estoppel is a substitute for consideration, whereas there has been a reasonable detrimental reliance on a promise. And it looks like this if you put it on a timeline. Now, this is different. The picture I showed you before, the consideration and the promise motivated at the same moment in time. Now we actually have an elapse of time. We have a promise that's made. Later, there is a reliance on the promise and that promise reliance causes a detriment. In some of these cases, we will enforce it. We will stop the person from denying the promise. And this is why this is the doctrine of estoppel. Later on, when you say, I didn't make that promise, I'm not going to hold to that promise, I'm going to defend against that promise because it was not supported by consideration. Estop, you can't deny that promise. Williston talked about this with his story about the tramp. And he gave an example. A benevolent man sees a tramp, a, a, a poor person. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's 29 degrees outside. You know, and, and he's walking by, and some poor person is walking without a coat on. He says, if you go to the corner store, I will buy you a coat. Now, let's say that person later changes his mind. Maybe he sees after the, the, the tramp starts to walk off that he's got keys to a Lexus hanging out of his back pocket. 
right? And he, and he no longer wants to make that promise or for any other reason. Is he, is he required to keep that promise? What we first ask is their consideration in the Wilson Tramp example. Was the benevolent man trying to induce, uh, was, was he induced by the prospect of the tramp taking a walk? No, the benevolent man didn't care about the tramp taking a walk. He cared about making a gift. And it was simply a condition of receiving a gift. The gift is over here. You have to walk over here to get it, right? right? The $1,000 piece of paper is on the floor now. Anyone who wants it can take it, but you have to walk down to the front of the room and pick it up. That's not consideration. I don't want you to walk in front of the room. I'm just trying to give a gift. The gift is over there, and you have to go and get it. Similarly, we talked about Kirksey v. Kirksey, in which case a man writes to his sister and says, uh, if you, I, you've come upon a hard time, you're in a bad way. If you move the 60 miles to my house, I will give you land on which you can raise your family. And we ask, again, the same question. Why are they making this move? Is Antilico making the move to perform a bargain or simply to get a gift? What would a reasonable person think when Kirksey made this promise? Did he care about Antilico making the move? Did he want her to pack up all her stuff in a carriage and in the late 1800s drive across the state? Uh, no, she simply had to move to get the gift of living on the land. And this isn't fair, in a sense. There's no consideration. And so, and so Antilico can't enforce her promise under the law. It isn't fair, she says. What can she do? What can we do when the law provides an unjust result? We can potentially prevail under equitable remedies, equitable, fair remedies, trying to get fairness where the law doesn't provide it. We then, after we've determined no consideration, ask, was there the elements of promissory estoppel? And here, Kirksey's promise did induce Antilico's reliance. She relied to her detriment. She no longer had her home. And the court, in that case, found it would be unjust not to enforce the promise. So promissory estoppel, then, is the principle that a promise, we still need a promise, but a promise made without consideration may be enforced to prevent injustice if the promisor should have reasonably expected the promisee to rely on the promise, and the promisee actually did rely on the promise, which means we have essentially four elements to look for, four main elements. We need to find that there was a promise, and the promise is just like the offer analysis we do when we look at offer acceptance and consideration. It has to be clear and definite that a court could enforce it. There has to be reliance on that promise, both that the promisor expected uh, reliance by the promisee, and the promisee actually did rely on it. And that reliance caused a detriment. The promisee was worse off because the promise was relied upon, and it would cause injustice if this were not enforced. And some will say that that means that reliance had to be reasonable. Because if it's an unjust reliance, it's not injustice. If it's an unreasonable reliance, it's not an injustice not to enforce it. So the promissory estoppel doctrine is found in the restatement section 91, which reads a promise which the promisor should reasonably expect to induce action or forbearance on the part of the promisee or a third person, and which does induce such action or forbearance is binding if injustice can be avoided only by the enforcement of that promise. And the remedy granted may be limited as justice requires. Let's look at a few examples. Here, we don't need to have a bargain. We, we needed a bargain for consideration. Now we simply need a promise, reliance to the detriment, which can cause an injustice if not enforced. So here we have an illustration. A, knowing that B was going to college, promises B that A will give him $5,000 on completion of his course. B goes to college, borrows and spends more than $5,000 for college expenses. When he has nearly completed the course, A notifies him of his intention to revoke the promise. A's promise is binding, and A and B is entitled to payment. Do we have the elements here? Is there a promise? Yes, there is a promise. A promised B, uh, B promised A that he would give him $5,000 to attend college. Was there reliance on that promise? Well, B knew that he was, he was intending to induce A to go to college. A actually went to college and incurred a debt. Sorry, B, B actually went to college. B actually went to college and incurred a debt because A intended that result. Was that to the person's detriment? Well, he didn't have money. He would not have gone on his own. We assume that he did not want to put himself in a debt position, and so there was a detriment that he incurred. And the court here would find uh, on these narrow facts that justice required enforcement of that promise. However, the remedy can be limited as justice requires. Another illustration, A applies to B, a distributor of radios manufactured by C, 
for a dealer franchise to sell seized products. Such franchises are revocable at will. Things that are revocable at will, we can talk about them being potentially illusory. In any event, uh, the B erroneously informs A that C has accepted the application and will soon award the franchise uh, that A can proceed to employ salesmen and solicit orders and A will receive an initial delivery of at least 30 radios. A ex expends $1,150 in preparing to do business but does not receive the franchise or any radios. And here, the expectation damages, if given the full remedy, what did this person lose? They lost the money that they spent, $1,150, $1,150. They also lost lost profits in the radios. But here the court found justice did not require paying for the lost profit. Just illustrating the point that when we're in an equitable situation, the remedy can be limited as justice requires. And this is why we always try to find a non-equitable remedy first. Because if we have a contract, even if the consideration is insufficient, which is not a thing, if there's consideration is sufficient, the bargain will be enforced. Here we can limit that as justice requires. And again, we see that this has to do with our timeline. And the elements here are we have a promise, which the promisor uh, expected or intended to induce reliance. The, the, often the plaintiff who's trying to enforce it, uh, the promisee, actually was induced and did rely. There was a detriment to the promisee who made that reliance. And then justice requires enforcement of the promise. Promissory restitution is our second equitable remedy that is also an alternative to consideration. It's a substitute for consideration where a promise is made to pay for a benefit previously received. And now our timeline looks a bit different. Now the benefit comes first. Someone received a benefit and later makes a promise to pay for it. When is that binding? It's binding when it would cause injustice not to enforce that promise. Again, it's a slippery concept. We have more illustrations here to try to pin it down. This is called, in the restatement, the material benefit rule. It's also called promise for benefit received. We're not using the term past consideration because there is no such thing as past consideration. Past consideration gets Cody fingers. It doesn't exist. We don't talk about that under the law. Instead, we talk about a promise for benefit received, a promise made in recognition of a benefit previously received by the promisor from the promisee is binding to the extent necessary to prevent injustice. So we have three elements. We need to find a benefit first. And second, we find a promise. We always need a promise, and that promise must be sufficiently definite, just like what we talk about when we talk about an offer being sufficiently de definite under Restatement Section 33. And there must be an injustice that would result if it wasn't enforced. Illustration. The benefit has to inure to the person who's making the promise. <clears throat> a gives emergency care to B's adult son while the son is sick and far away from home. B subsequently promises to reimburse A for his expenses. The promise is not binding. Right? We read this case. What was this about? The promise did not inure, the benefit did not inure to the promisor. He was making a, a promise on behalf of a benefit inured to a third person. Now, this was a case that specifically said the son was independent from the father, had lived apart from a long time, and so don't get too mixed up about property and sons and fathers. The point here was that these were separate individuals, and the benefit did not come to the person who made the promise. Another example, A lends money to B who dies. B's widow promises to pay the, the debt, right? Did, B directly, did B's widow directly benefit? No, maybe indirectly, but it's too attenuated. Even here, the promise is not binding under this section. Illustration three is a little odder, but it reminds us that we have an equitable remedy only when justice requires. And the illustration from the restatement talks about immoral relations. I'm not sure exactly what that is. You can imagine that for yourselves, right? A has an immoral relation with B, a woman not his wife, to her injury. A subsequent promise to reimburse B for her loss is not binding under this section. Courts will only enforce it when justice so requires, and the immorality of the action, enforcing an immoral action, would, in a sense, pervert justice. However, we will enforce bargains that are made, promises that are made for a benefit previously received when it corrects a mistake. Two examples. One, A is employed by B to repair a vacant house. By mistake, A repairs the house next door. Wow. Okay, well, a subsequent promise by C to pay the value to A is binding. 
Right? It was a mistake. The benefit was received by C. C got their house repaired, later agreed to pay for it. That promise will be binding. Likewise, A pays B a debt and gets a signed receipt. Later, B obtains a default judgment against A for the amount of the debt, and A pays twice. Right? Almost like double jeopardy here, right? You pay the same debt twice. You don't actually owe it. B subsequently promises to refund the second payment, to correct the mistake. A mistakenly paid twice. B promises to return it. Now, that is a gift. There's no consideration for the returning of that second amount, but that promise to correct the mistake that benefited the first person is binding. Likewise, promises for what the restatement calls necessaries are binding. In this case, A finds B's escaped bull and feeds and cares for it, so the property is not destroyed. B's subsequent promise to pay reasonable compensation to A is binding. Emergency services, promises for, made for rendering of emergency services in the past are also often binding. A saves B's life in an emergency and is totally and permanently disabled in doing so. We read this case. Right? This is McGowan. One month later, B promises to pay A a $15 amount every two weeks for the rest of A's life. And B makes the payments for eight years until B dies. Will this promise be enforced against the executor of B's estate? Yes, it will. Right? Because we had a benefit. A person saved your life. That's a benefit. Later, there was a promise. I promised to pay you $15 every two weeks for the injuries that were caused by you saving my life. And it would be unjust not to enforce that. A subsequent promise to pay uh, may also be contemplated, may also, uh, may also result in, in a binding enforcement. A submits to B at B's request a plan for advertising products manufactured by B, expecting payment only if the plan is adopted. So first thing is A is trying to get some business. A is not intending to make a gift, but the giving of the plans is not supported by consideration. But what is the intention here? The intention is to later get compensated in some kind of way. A is not a benevolent man who is trying to give free advertising products to B because B is unable to pay for advertising. That's not the fact pattern here. It's a lost leader in business. Because of a change in the selling agreements, B rejects the plan without giving it fair consideration. Ah, so we have now the, the plan being rejected, which B is allowed to do, but B does it without fair consideration. So that's a hint that there is some injustice here that a court will try to remedy. The intent was that the plan would be reviewed in good faith. It was rejected without fair consideration. B's subsequent promise to reimburse for the expenses is binding. Now note, the court would not simply enforce this agreement to pay for the advertising if there was no subsequent promise. We need the subsequent promise. The benefit was received. The promise was made. It would be unjust not to enforce it because B did not give fair consideration in this circumstance. Likewise, uh, a gift that was not really a gift but was an intention to be reimbursed in some way would also be reimbursed. A contributes capital to B, an insurance company, on the understanding that B is not liable to reimburse A, but that A will be reimbursed through salary and commissions. Later, A withdraws from the company, and B promises to pay him 10% of the premiums until he is reimbursed. Likewise, that promise is binding. Sometimes you can stand in for the promise of another. An example here, keep in mind, again, the promisor is still the one receiving the benefit. And that gets a little trickier here, but you'll see that. A digs a well on B's land. We're going to assume that improves the property. So now B has more valuable property because A dug a well on it. But they did that as a result of a bargain with B's tenant, C. B was not involved at the time. C is unable to pay as agreed. There is an expectation to be paid by C. B received a benefit as a result of this deal. C cannot pay. A promises to stand in for C and pay the reasonable value. This is actually very similar to the person fixing the wrong house. The benefit was received. The property now is improved by the nature of the well. This was based on the contract of a tenant that was on the property. And there was a later promise to pay the reasonable value. Now, again, had there not been a promise, a court would not come after C and make them pay. We don't have benefits thrust upon us. And we don't have benefits. The courts will not enforce benefits thrust upon us because that does not show we're moving property to its higher value. But in cases like this, we have ratified the past action, essentially saying, I approve of what you did. I would have made that bargain had I done so at that time. Waiving the statute of frauds is another area the restatement identifies as 
binding promises. By statute, an agreement authorizing a real estate broker to sell land for compensation is void unless the agreement is in writing. So we have a requirement for a signed writing by statute. This is the statute of frauds. Now, A, the broker goes and does the deal, procures the land without the written agreement. So this promise is not enforceable, even though it's supported by consideration, because of the statute of frauds. A subsequent promise to pay effectively waives the statute of frauds. The party is stopped, is prevented from asserting the statute of frauds defense because it would be unfair and unjust. The promise is binding. However, likewise with promissory estoppel and promissory restitution, the remedy can be limited as justice requires. Two-part illustration, part one, A, a married woman of 60 has rendered household services without compensation over a period of years for B, a man of 80 living alone with no close relatives. B has a net worth of $3 million and has often assured A that she will be paid for her services. Now that's not an enforceable promise because it's not definite enough to be binding. But when he does make, uh, uh, A has a net worth room and offers uh, assurance that A will, uh, will pay her, uh, will pay A for reasonable service, value of services rendered, not in excess of 6,000. However, B executes and delivers a written promise to pay $25,000 to be taken from my estate. Now, this is a wealthy man. He's received $6,000 of benefit. He's promised to pay uh, some amount. I guess he felt very benevolent at the end and wanted to give her more. In this case, he had a lot. He had a written promise that evidenced that. And so here, we're just over the line, and the court will enforce that promise. However, it will limit that under other facts, the facts being otherwise stated. We have a wealthy man who received services for a long time from an older woman who, uh, a, well, a woman of 60 uh, and, a, and a much older man. Uh, the wealthy man uh, makes his promise orally. And instead of saying you could have $25,000, he offers the whole $3 million estate. Courts will reduce the value to the value of her services in that case because we are so out of line. So unlike with consideration, again, we want to find, if you're, certainly if you're trying to enforce the promise, you first want to find consideration because under the doctrine of consideration, your benefit, your uh, consideration value won't be reduced. But here, the value of the promise can be reduced as justice requires. And so again, to see this on the timeline, we need a benefit. And the benefit has to come to the promisor. The promisor must make a promise. The promise needs to fall in one of these general types of categories. We've seen those illustrations. They include correcting mistakes, paying for emergency services, waiving the statute of frauds. And failure to enforce that promise would cause an injustice to the promisee. So to sum up, we. So we understand contract law best when we see it within the entire framework of the common law. The, again, purpose of property law, we ascribe property to essentially its first taker. And we have a lot of rules that you've learned about that. We use contract law to move that property by its place of highest value by having mutually induced bargains. We assume that when people privately order society, when they decide they want to exchange an apple for an orange, it makes them both better off. So we enforce those promises and we prevent people from whacking you over the head and taking that apple because that disrupts that private ordering. Sometimes the law doesn't get it right and we have the doctrines of restitution and equity to fill those gaps. In fact, sometimes people will use the law for unjust ends and the court of equity steps in when the law is sort of flipped on its head and would create an injustice. But the law of restitution, the law of estoppel, is limited to the uh, extent that justice so requires. And so we have our three doctrines here. Uh, we have the doctrine of consideration, where the promisor's promise must induce the promisee's promise that happens at one moment in time. We have the doctrine of promissory estoppel, where a promise later induces a reliance. So the promise happens first, reliance happens next, and there is a detriment that occurs because of that, that injustice would result from not enforcing. And we also have the doctrine of prom uh, promise or reliance, where we have first the benefit and later a promise to pay for it. That promise to pay coming from the person who received the benefit and injustice would require. Now, these concepts of when justice so requires are loose, but we have the restatement illustrations and our case law to help us through it. And that, in a nutshell, is the doctrine of consideration and its alternatives. All right, any questions? And that's why they make coffee. <laughs>